Prosperity Health as well. Um, and uh, more information on those programs can be found at priorityhealth.com. So through the last year, um, our routines have all changed. You are all very aware of that, I'm sure, because of COVID-19 and all the challenges that it's brought to us. And many of us have spent some time outside, even more than usual, because um, you know we've been isolated and being told to be uh, away from friends and family. So we get outside and, and I'm tired of being inside as well. And as we'll learn more, uh, more about in the next few minutes, fresh air, sunshine, and of course, trees provide us a very natural dose of preventive medicine. And we're excited to learn more about that today. As Michiganders, we know the importance of being outside, especially when the weather's nice, like it's been the past few days and even today. And across Priority and Spectrum Health, our leaders have encouraged us to get outside, go move, stand up, and certainly go for a walk if we can spend some time outside during lunch or, or whenever we have a moment. And that's a great thing for us all to think about. It's a great stress reliever. It's a great time to clear your mind, even take a conference call if you can on mute and go for a little walk, get those steps in and, uh, and get outside as we, as we head into spring here. Through Priorities partnership with Relief Michigan, we will be planting hundreds of trees and communities across the state, which we are very proud of and very, very um, um, happy to support. Before we get started today, we would like to show you a video um, from the Minnesota DNR that will set up the conversation. And uh, so enjoy this video, about two and a half minutes, and then I'll be back to introduce our speaker for the morning or afternoon, I guess. <laughs> Trees. We all know them, I've planted them, they're great. But considering their effect on our health and well-being, I think we still underestimate the true value of trees. To start, trees remove tons of air pollutants and particles, including a whole bunch of bad gases that end in oxide. Trust me, no one wants a lung full of sulfur dioxide. In fact, communities with trees have lower rates of childhood asthma. Most people I know like to go outside, and trees help block harmful UV rays that can cause skin cancer. Plus, trees can lower the air temperature by 10 degrees and help us from overheating in the summer. Let's say you're feeling crabby or stressed out. A walk in the woods might be all the medicine you need. Forests have a natural calming effect which can actually lower your blood pressure and heart rate. Exposure to trees and green spaces also decreases depression, stress, and mental fatigue. Great news for adults. And when kids get to play in the woods, it's much the same. We're more relaxed and focused, which helps us do better in school and generally makes us more agreeable people. Even better news for adults. As John Muir once noted, in every walk with nature, one receives far more than he seeks. It's amazing that trees have such a profound effect on our well-being. I honestly can't imagine a world without them. This year, won't you plant a tree with me? Whoops, ow. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Trees. We all know them. I've climbed them. They're right. great. So let's see here. Okay. Trees. All right. We Sorry all about that. I've... Here we go. <laughs> all right. <laughs> it was a great video. And so watching yes, it, it was. was <laughs> Of course, third time's a charm. Um, great message in there, obviously, and, and looking forward to hearing more about that. And I'm fascinated by trees and nature and, and the oxygen they produce. And, uh, you know, it's a very reciprocal relationship we have with nature in that sense. So um, it's, it's very cool. And I love that video. Um, one housekeeping note um, before we get started here. If you have any questions, please use the chat feature um, that is provided so we can address any questions at the end of the presentation. Um, and we'll have ample time 
allotted for that as we go forward. So now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce um, our presenter for today, the Relief Michigan Executive Director, Melinda Jones. Ever since Melinda helped establish Relief in 1988, she's worked with more than 400 Michigan communities to plant more than 30,000 trees and educate homeowners on the need to properly select, plant, and maintain their trees. Prior to joining Relief Michigan, Melinda spent much of her career as a utility forester and operator operating her own consulting business, Unique Trees and Shrubs. She's also served on the board of directors for the International Society of Arboriculture from 1998 to 2006, chairing the International Development Committee and co-chairing the Diversity Committee, which is great. Melinda holds a degree in forestry from MSU. And again, we thank from Priority Health uh, Relief Michigan for being a great partner and we're looking forward to today's discussion. It's now my distinct pleasure to introduce Melinda Jones. Melinda? Okay. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, before we get started, I wanted to just give you a little bit of background about uh, Relief Michigan. And before I forget, I need to remind you that uh, at the end of this presentation in the chat box, there will be a link to a Google survey, which will provide all of you that need ISA and SAF credits a way to obtain them. So I promised Ashley I would remember to say that. Okay, uh, Relief Michigan, 33 years, uh, got started in 1988. Um, we plant trees, uh, as Tom mentioned, uh, to date over 400,000 communities, upper, lower, peninsula, urban, rural, uh, wherever we're needed. We also uh, feel strongly about educating the public on the value of trees and the need to properly select and plant them. And we partner with communities on all kinds of local tree related projects. Uh, you know, urban tree canopy analysis, uh, uh, inventories, whatever, uh, we're pretty diverse. I just wanted to say, however, that, um, I'll go to the next slide here, oops. And if I can remember to go back, thank you. Oh, well, I guess I won't go back. Um, let's see, okay, uh, so pretty much I've talked about this. Uh, forestry network meetings. Uh, what we have found, uh, we're, we truly are a statewide organization. Uh, and as we've traveled statewide over 33 years, we realize that there are a lot of smaller communities that uh, do not have the expertise and have individuals who wear a wide variety of hats. So what we try to do two to three times a year is get individuals uh, together as part of a loose leaf called Forestry Network. Uh, we bring speakers who normally talk down around in the Lansing area or Southeast Michigan up for a half day session to discuss uh, topics of interest to the participants. Um, and it's a great way to collaborate. We've uh, probably the best thing is where we've had smaller communities get to know each other finally and they can loan each other equipment and all kinds of stuff and then we have an extensive homeowner education uh, workshop. Um, if you go to our website, you'll see this handy dandy little map and it just kind of, it's interactive. You can click on it, gives you an idea of uh, if we've been in your area, but obviously it was impossible to get 400 dots on there. So that just is a, a representative. When we got started in 1988, the reason why we did, which kind of ties into this whole presentation, is that uh, that was a year when there were extensive, extreme uh, heat storms. And as a result, a number of individuals uh, died uh, because it was, they had no air conditioning, they had nowhere to go. And at the time it was uh, realized, which we'll talk about in a minute, that it's always 10 degrees cooler in the shade and a lot of urban areas did not have that. Uh, so uh, the national organization was put together. The idea was given away to the states and uh, Relief Michigan was, was born. So uh, to get started, when we talk about individual trees, we refer to the tree's leaves as the canopy or the crown of the tree. The urban tree canopy 
or you could call it the rural tree canopy is the collective whole of all the individual trees within the specified uh, community. So if you, um, this happens to be Grand Rapids, but if you were to fly over and look down and see all of the green cover, be it public property, private property, all of that collectively is referred to as the tree canopy. So what's of uh, increasing concern is that we are losing our urban tree canopy. Uh, about 36 million trees per year across the entire United States. And a lot of that's to be expected. Old age, uh, development, uh, insects and diseases, which are rampant in Michigan. I mean, we've had the Dutch elm disease, we've had the emerald ash borer, we've got Asian longhorn beetle, we've got the hemlock, what, ugh, I can never say the last name. Uh, anyway, I won't even try. But anyway, all kinds of diseases, oak wilt, storm damage. And unfortunately, uh, like when we started, when we got started back in 1988, for every four trees which were being reviewed, uh, removed, only one was being replaced. And that unfortunately continues today. So coinciding, of course, with the loss of tree cover is an increase in pavement. So 40% um, of these areas are where trees once grew. Um, and the overall loss of infrastructure and health benefits due to this loss of uh, tree canopy is about $96 million a year. Now, as far as uh, Michigan's urban tree canopy, uh, we're about one of 23 states that's experiencing a statistically significant decline in tree canopy. You see the facts and figures there, but when you talk about it and we step back, we are losing over 5,300 acres per year. And that's pretty substantial. And most of that, uh, quite frankly, is due to um, an increase in impervious surface where urban development is going wild. Uh, building new subdivisions is going wild. So anyway, that is uh, the primary reason in addition to the insects as we discussed in old age. And so many times people say, so uh, what do you want your tree canopy to be per community? And the average tree canopy goal for Michigan communities is around 40%. And we have worked with communities that have like 19% uh, to those that are up north that have a much higher, greater percent. So why is an urban tree canopy important? It's because trees are incredible, efficient, natural problem solvers. Their benefits are directly proportion, proportionate to the amount of tree canopy in a community. Uh, they result in boosted economies, increased home values, energy savings, clean water, safer neighborhoods, and healthier communities, which is what we're going to get into. So why is an urban tree canopy important? Well, when we got started 33 years ago, we planted trees because for every four being removed, only one was being replaced. It was always 10 degrees cooler in the shade. And quite frankly, trees made people look, feel good. Uh, they liked them. However, over the years, um, those benefits have been segmented into economic benefits. Uh, for example, if somebody is uh, driving down a small community with uh, trees, they're more apt to stop. And if they do stop, not only are they willing to pay more for um, parking, but they spend 12% more in a community. Then you've got the social benefits, environmental benefits, and most importantly, human health benefits. This is very much an evolving field. All of these benefits noted here are now quantifiable. Uh, we can talk facts, figures, dollar amounts, and, but it's an evolving field, especially when it comes to human health benefits. So today, I'm going to pretty much give you the highlights of the research being done. We uh, found this article 
um, in the Wall Street Journal, obviously, and it really caught our eye because basically it says, uh, is two hours outdoors the new 10,000 steps? And so it's been, uh, scientific understanding has been growing about health benefits. And so I'm excited, of course, to show uh, some of the latest findings. I just wanted to show you the point that research is coming out all the time. This was just very, very recent. And uh, we're really beginning to understand how trees play a very comprehensive role in our well being. So, nature has officially been recognized as a promising and effective approach to integrative health care. Um, in the US. And one of the important parts of that is the fact that, um, believe it or not, studies show Americans spend 87% of our time indoors and 6% in an enclosed vehicle. So these are all averages, of course, but overall, a shocking 93% of our time is spent. Uh, indoors, not outdoors. So the public, um, the participant study, which recently came out, uh, found people were significantly more likely to report good health and well being when they spend 120 minutes or more in a week. Now, that doesn't mean just once a week going out for a two hour walk, although it could mean that. It could mean, you know, 15 minutes every day. Uh, what does not count is uh, walking from your home to your car and from your car back to your home. Uh, however, they've done some research and found that the effects do peak at 200 to 300 uh, minutes a week. So now we get into a uh, number of specific benefits. Um, visual exposure to trees lowers stress within five minutes, and this is shown by changes in blood pressure and muscle tension. Um, as a result of this, you have lower levels of sadness after visiting parks. Uh, the stress just seems to melt away, and the World Health Organization has now identified stress and low physical activity as two of the leading contributors to premature death in developed nations. So mental well-being improves from exercising outdoors compared to exercising indoors, as much as we love those Pelotons. Uh, it also results in revitalization. So a lot of times they're saying, you know, you've got a stressful day, you've hit a roadblock, you can't listen to one more Zoom boom. So to put it on mute, go outside, walk around the block, ideally where there are some trees and it has the effect of calming you down. Uh, trees have even been shown to help fight cancer. Um, again, a one, two hour walk in the woods was shown to increase the number of cancer cells, cancer killer cells and anti-cancer proteins. Cortisol um, in the blood and adrenaline in the urine also significantly uh, decreased. So it's, uh, trees are touching all aspects. Um, trees reduce inflammation. So time in a forest has also been linked to decreased inflammation, which is implicated, of course, in many chronic uh, diseases. Regional air quality. Now that's, uh, that's become a big one. I mean, we all grew up learning that uh, trees absorb carbon dioxide, monoxide, ozone, particular and it produces education for us to breathe. And that's where we got the same trees are the lungs of the earth. Without trees and other vegetation, we would not be there because there would be no way to do this conversion into, um, into oxy oxygen. So short and long-term exposure to air pollution has been associated with a wide range of human health effects, including increased respiratory symptoms, hospitalization for heart or lung diseases, and even premature death. So as we talked about, um, I don't think any of us can disagree that if you're walking down a very, very hot pavement or across a parking lot, um, 
it's extremely hot, but as soon as you go into the shade of a tree, it's 10 degrees cooler. Now, trees and forests shade, obviously, impervious surfaces such as pavements, which, of course, um, is where the temperature is retained. It also reduces the temperature of the storm uh, runoff. And a lot of times you don't think about this, but if you don't reduce the temperature of the stormwater runoff, when it then goes into local streams, et cetera, it increases the temperature of that stream. And a lot of the fish and other wildlife, which is in the streams, then of course die. Uh, it reduces the air temperature, which reduces the formation of pollutants that are heat dependent, such as ozone, and they cool the air, store carbon, reduce uh, energy use. So often you'll hear us mention an urban heat island. It's like, uh, okay, you've got a parking lot. Uh, how are we going to make it not so much an urban heat um, island? So when buildings and roads replace the land, the surfaces that were once permeable and moist are now impermeable and dry. And that's why urban regions are much warmer than their rural surroundings uh, forming an island. So that's where we come up with urban heat islands. So the impact of the urban heat islands, uh, increased energy consumption for air conditioning. Obviously you've got to keep it going to cool everything down elevated emissions, impaired water quality. We talked about the storm water. That's a very, very big topic nowadays with trees and communities is that in order to slow down what goes into the local um, systems, uh, you have trees which act as umbrellas. They absorb the water as it comes down and slowly allow it to uh, travel down the trunk and into the water in a much more controlled manner. And obviously an impact is compromised health and comfort. So a study finds that heat related deaths in the US uh, would nearly double without existing tree canopy. Um, the EPA has estimated that more than 1,300 deaths in the U.S. are caused by extreme heat per year. And that's why when we start getting hit with all of uh, the extreme heat, they open up the shelters, any place to get people out of hot apartments and homes. June 2019 was the hottest on record, according to NASA. Uh, the study estimates that existing tree canopy in all U.S urban areas prevents uh, 1,200 deaths per year. So heat-related deaths would nearly double without tree canopy. And studies also show that urban tree cover annually supplies heat reduction services worth 5.3 to 12.1 billion. This is where we get into um, preventing the use of, uh, or reducing the use of air conditioning items such as that. Trees offer protection from UV rays. We've heard about this for years. And so if you're standing in direct sunlight, it's gonna take you about 20 minutes to burn. Uh, if you're under a tree providing 50% coverage, say honey locusts, uh, it's gonna take you 50 minutes to burn. And if you're under full sh shade, like a buckeye tree or some kind of a Norway maple species, a sycamore, a London plane tree, it's going to take you 100 minutes uh, before you get a sunburn. So that's really, really critical, especially for children. And one of our biggest concerns in when we work with communities, one of the first places that we um, like to plant or we suggest planting is around all of these play areas that seem to be being built everywhere and the communities do an excellent job of raising money for these play areas but then they never take into consideration the fact that um, we need to have some trees around there not only for the children but for the parents who are watching the children Also, people walk and jog uh, on shaded streets. Um, it's just a lot nicer than 
going down a highway and encourages interactions with neighbors and increases the sense of um, community. Neighborhood parks uh, promote exercise, especially to people living within a mile of a park. Uh, people with the highest levels of greenery are three times as likely to be physical act physically active. I mean, it's just nicer to do so. And they're also 40% less likely to be overweight or, or, be, or obese than residents living in less green settings. Another study calculated a $2,200 reduction in the average annual healthcare charges per an adult for those who had been sedentary, but then became active. So I think that's a pretty critical um, comment there. Let's see here. Okay, and another survey um, resulted, found that a 10% increase in neighborhood tree cover resulted in the 19% um, obesity. Uh, the results demonstrated that among all the predictors, um, a higher homicide rate was associated with higher body mass indexes and higher prevalence of obesity and a higher density of street trees was associated with lower body uh, mass indices and lower prevalence of obesity. So um, one of the things that we're finding now is that a lot of communities are establishing goals of wha where they would like their residents to be within walking distance of a park, 15 minutes, uh, maybe up to a mile, but uh, by having that proximity to a park, people are more apt to use it. And then also, of course, then you start seeing these little exercise trails and everything that uh, encourage people to be um, active. I think really important is the fact that trees absorb and block sound, reducing uh, noise po uh, pollution by almost 40%. I don't know about you, but uh, having lived close to the I-96 uh, Jeffries Freeway myself, uh, it was really, really nice to have lots of trees and to retreat to my backyard because the noise would actually be absorbed and be blocked out. Uh, in the US, uh, about 30 million workers are exposed to hazardous sound levels on the job. And studies have revealed that as children grow, they are exposed to sounds that can threaten their health and cause learning problems. Uh, noises elevate systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure and heart rate, uh, thus producing both acute and chronic health effects. So how do trees help? Vegetation reduces noise pollution through a phenomenon called sound and attenuation which is the reduction of sound intensity. Uh, normally, uh, the sound occurs as the energy of sound dissipates over long distances until not enough energy is left to vibrate the air molecules. Vegetation hastens the normal attenuation mechanisms of absorption, deflection, reflect, refraction, and masking. So in summary, the leaves, the twigs, the trees, they're absorbing all of this. They're calming it down before it's hitting your ears. Uh, green environments improve work productivity by helping to restore the mind for mental fatigue. And I would have to think, <coughs> excuse me, that those of us working at home can certainly attest to this, especially for those of us who need to work from the basement. Mm. It's a lot nicer to be able to look outside, look at the trees, give your mind a rest. Um, in one study, it showed that workers without nature views claim 23% more sick days than workers with views of nature. Cognitive fa fatigue occurs after periods of intense concentration or directed attention as our mind works to fend off distractions and competing attention demands. Mental fatigue can lead to irritability, lack of concentration, inability to solve problems, and increased likelihood of making mistakes or causing accidents. And I would think uh, during this last very challenging year, we have all experienced uh, those characteristics. 
experience of the nature world helps restore the mind from the mental fatigue of work studies, thus office plants, views from windows, helps reduce stress, boost productivity, improve job satisfaction. Um, college students, for example, who have more natural views from their dorm rooms have scored higher on tests of capacity to direct attention and rate themselves able to function more effectively. In studies of lower income houses, households, the greenness of a young person's home or window views positively impacted cognitive functioning, ability to concentrate and self-discipline. This one is important in that it's been shown for many years now that patients who are recovering from surgery in hospital rooms with window views of natural scenes had shorter post-operative hospital stays, received fewer negative evaluations in nurses' notes, and took fewer potent uh, medicines than matched patients in similar rooms with windows facing a brick wall. So I guess it can easily be said that when you look out at nature, if this was a hospital room, it gives you more of a sense of a hope that you're going to recover in a timely fashion as opposed to just looking at a wall. Health benefits directly related to children. I think honestly, this is what got this whole uh, research going as, for, as far as quantifiable benefits. Uh, everyone loves children and they want them to have the highest quality of life possible. So one of the things that became evident very early on is that children with ADD function better after activities in green settings. It calms them down. It helps them concentrate. Um, a walk through a park is equal to peak effects of two typical ADHD medications. And there was indeed a study of children with um, ADD who played in a windowless indoor setting and the fact that they had more severe symptoms than those who played in a grassy outdoor space. A lot of work is being done right now, and we really didn't put a slide in here, but <laughs> more so over in Europe. A lot of schools um, are holding more of their classes outdoors. Uh, the schools are being built actually around trees where Trees are in the middle of the schools and the kids get to climb up and then slide down. And um, it just finds that uh, they're, they're learning better and they are much healthier. Research in New York City found that <coughs> asthma rates were highest in parts of the city with the lowest tree dust density. Um, asthma is the leading cause of chronic disease in children. This has been shown. More than 25 million Americans have asthma. This is 7.7% of adults and 8.4% of children. Asthma has been increasing since the early 1980s in all ages, sex, and racial groups. Uh, trees filter airborne pollutants and reduce the conditions that cause asthma and other respiratory problems. Researchers from Columbia University found childhood asthma rates were highest in parts of the city where the tree density was the lowest. The rate of asthma fell by 29% for every extra 343 trees planted per square kilometer, a pattern that held true even after taking into account of differing sources of pollution, levels of affluence and population density. Now, this is probably out of all of the research, the most controversial because what about pollen? Uh, so it doesn't that cause asthma, it causes allergies, that sort of thing. So in looking into this, there really are 50,000 different tree species in the world. And out of those, only 100 of them uh, cause allergies. So there's a difference between allergies, asthma, uh, it depends on where the children are, what type of trees, 
Um, as you know, the pollen starts to be produced and released from late winter through early January, of course, depending on where you live. And I did kind of look into it because I don't know about you, but people are saying, oh my gosh, I can't stand these uh, pine trees. They're releasing all of this pollen. It's driving me crazy. But the trees that actually will cause you the most problem uh, related to allergies are alder, birch, ash, box elder, uh, beech, cottonwood, maples, and willow. So doctors are increasingly um, prescribing time and nature to patients. And I was at a conference probably about three years ago where there were a number of uh, health professionals who were discussing this. And what they're, they're actually doing is, again, they're prescribing time in parks and green spaces as a way of treating a range of conditions, including high blood pressure, anxiety, and depression. So state by state, the movement towards developing a more interactive and meaningful relationship to nature for one's health and well-being is growing. Uh, for example, Vermont rates as one of the nation's healthiest states. Uh, and they came up with what they call a park prescription program. Doctors prescribe time outdoors to their patients. Uh, they encourage them to go to state parks. And in many state parks, they're um, actually developing kind of a, what would you call an obstacle course for children. I don't know if you've seen some of those YouTube videos where teachers are actually putting them in hallways where they have to jump three times and then leap from place to place to place so that they start concentrating and by concentrating they slow down well they're actually building the same sort of things uh, outside and again just to reiterate which is kind of what we started off with here is the fact that unfortunately um, americans spend 87 percent of their time um, inside and so hopefully this is a trend that will um, disappear uh, shortly as more doctors prescribe this yeah, as opposed to various medications. Um, I think it's definitely a move in the right direction. So there are still many um, parts of why and how trees affect our health that we're trying to understand. But what we do know is that it works and that's why we need uh, trees. So again, out of all of the um, benefits of trees, aesthetic, economic, environmental, health is in the, uh, in the baby stage, for lack of a better word. But there will be more and more of this research that's being done. And it is being done uh, heavily by the US Forest Service and, of course, individual researchers across the um, world. And one other thing I wanted to mention is that I don't know if you've heard of forest bathing. That's another big thing right now. But basically, that's, uh, I think that's another way of saying that uh, you go out by yourself into a forest for approximately two hours and just walk around, meditate, uh, try to just get rid of all the bad thoughts. But uh, that's picking up speed also as something of interest. So how can you help as an individual? Well, you can help plant trees. And that's again, one of the reasons why uh, we, that's what we do. Uh, we plant statewide uh, and we do it because it's a very family oriented activity. And we love it when uh, children come and they bring their buckets and their little shovels and, one of the things I think you would all agree with nowadays is that uh, people, uh, kids don't have an opportunity to get dirty. They don't get an opportunity to actually get in and make a difference. And what we find with the involvement of children is that, and actually families in general, there's never been a planting that we do that doesn't make people laugh, they enjoy, they walk away feeling that they've done something uh, productive. Uh, many times the kids will come back and they will um, uh, name their trees and, 
you know, it's something. I mean, how many of us drive by a place where we grew up and remember when we brought home a seedling when we planted that blue spruce, which is, of course, way too close to the house now, but we did that and we're very proud of it. So we plant approximately 50, uh, 500 trees every year. The trees we plant, as you probably saw in the last picture, are larger, uh, one and a half to two inch uh, caliper. We plant on public property or property uh, accessible to the public. And we do it all with volunteers. And the reason we do that is that we believe very strongly in knowledge transfer and that if you learn the proper way to plant and maintain a tree, you're gonna go, oh, well, that wasn't so bad. You know, I've always wanted that tree at the local nursery to plant in my front yard or backyard. You won't have to go grab it, plant it, and have a very high success rate uh, that it will thrive. And this just gives you an idea of some of the smiling, happy faces that uh, from a uh, previous planting that we did. And uh, I think one of my past uh, or best um, favorite sayings is the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. So uh, Relief is supported by people like you. Uh, if you're interested in what we do, we uh, would suggest you go online to reliefmichigan.org and you can subscribe to our e-newsletter. Uh, which comes out every month. And we're pleased that Priority Health has become a uh, corporate sponsor. And as such, on a monthly basis, we have at least one tip related to health that is being sponsored by, by them. So uh, this webinar would not have been possible without uh, the support, support of our sponsor, Priority Health. So join me in thanking Tom. And at this point, uh, we will open it up to questions. So, Ashley. Great, thanks, Melinda. Um, I have a question about, given the evidence that viewing trees from hospital windows cuts down on the length of a hospital stay, um, Tom, this one is probably for you. Are you aware of hospitals with initiatives to plant trees on their grounds? Um, you know, not specifically, but I know that many hospitals are doing a lot of work to green their campus and make it walkable and, uh, and provide areas for, you know, lounging in the shade and so forth. So specifically for that reason, uh, you know, I think it's a tremendous um, um, reason to do that. And, but I do know that many campuses, hospital campuses are trying to do more to encourage people to be outside, which of course includes you know, sitting in the shade and, and, and going through, um, you know, park-like areas and so forth, because being at a hospital isn't always the most um, de-stressing place to be. So giving people a place to reflect and to, you know, to collect themselves and to just be outside, including staff um, and, and, you know, people who work in hospitals and are working long hours and, of course, frontline workers now um, to help them de-stress, you know, we're giving and making, um, making spaces for them to, to get outside and, and go for a walk or go out on their break and, and hang out outside. So I, I see tremendous value in that and, and certainly will encourage our hospitals to do that in the future. Great, thank you. Um, Melinda, this one's for you. Do you plant native trees or what, can you explain the philosophy about species selection? Certainly. Um, I certainly can do that. And I just wanted to thank those of you who are chatting and talking about uh, having asthma yourself and the fact that uh, you feel much healthier when you're outside because of the stress reduction benefits. So uh, yeah, having allergies myself, uh, it, it does make a difference to be outside. So thank you for those comments. Uh, native trees. Okay, native trees. Um, we try to plant as many native trees as possible, keeping in mind that native trees are not always the best uh, selection for urban environments. So it really depends on where you're going to plant. If you're going to plant, obviously, in a park um, where you have the opportunity of understory trees, you know, versus overstory trees, it makes a lot more sense. But if you're in an urban area, that is going to um, be subject, subjected to a lot of salt. Uh, those native trees, that's just not what they 
you know, grew up uh, learning to adapt to. So we select the tree for the site. Uh, we call it the right tree in the right place for the right purpose. We take in also into consideration when you think of some of the native trees, they grow extremely large. And a lot of the lawn extensions nowadays in communities um, are narrow. And by that, I mean between the street and the sidewalk. And so you certainly do not want to plant a native tree, uh, such as some sort of a, a maple, an oak, whatever, that is going to become mammoth um, in that small area so that the sidewalks will come up, you know, that sort of thing. But we feel very strongly about that. And another thing that's a real challenge is availability of native trees. Um, a lot of the nut species um, are smaller. Uh, the nurseries are just getting out the gates with them. And so, and also, as I'm sure a lot of you in the industry realize, um, when we kind of took a downturn in the economy a number of years ago, and especially after we got rid of the ash, uh, nurseries were at a loss as to what to do. So we're actually double timing it now, working with the nurseries to get these trees planted and available so that we can use them. So long-winded way of saying, if native trees are the way to go, we certainly love to plant them. If uh, for whatever reason, um, they're just not destined to survive, then we go with a species that will survive. Excellent. Um, would you be willing to list the trees most linked to asthma and allergies one more time for us? Sure. And I'd also be willing to put on a Facebook post exactly where I got that information because I got thinking about it last night. So let me find my notes here. Um, okay. Alder, uh, ash, beech, birch, box elder, cottonwood, maple, willow, and some varieties of oaks. Uh, those are the ones that I jotted down. Um, and if you want to uh, uh, type in your email address, um, Ashley can catch it and I can actually send you a link to where I got that information. Sounds good. Um, another one for you, Melinda. How much does the size of the tree affect the health benefits it provides? For example, a tree planted this year versus one planted 10 years ago. Well, um, obviously the larger the tree, uh, the more benefit that's going to be derived. I think that just makes sense. However, uh, it's always important to have not only a diversity of tree species, so we don't get ourselves into the emerald ash problem, but we also need to have a diversity of age. So no matter what you plant now, it is going to have a positive effect, but we strongly encourage communities to intersperse some of their larger trees with smaller trees so that you have differing um, uh, sizes of trees and benefits. Plus, and again, going back to when we got started, and even now, if, if you go to some of the older communities throughout uh, Michigan, um, everything's a silver maple. Silver maples all over the place and they're all falling apart and coming down. So again, that's why we go with the diversity of size, but obviously uh, the larger the tree gets, the more benefit uh, that is derived. Thanks. Um, maybe a question that you can both take a stab at. Um, so research is growing quickly in this field. How has our understanding change, changed compared to 10 years ago? And how do you think it will affect urban planning and medical advice going forward? Tom, do you wanna take a stab at that or? I'm uh, sure. So, um... From a, from a health and wellness perspective, I think, Melinda, you've provided some really great food for thought as far as programming and making resources available to communities and community members, as well as 
um, kind of in my forte uh, employees and, and, and how employers can support, um, you know, health and well-being by allowing time to go outside by, again, planting green spaces and so forth. Um, I think this research can definitely influence how um, communities are, um, you know, provided resources and programming. And, and I think it's, it, it's already in play in many places. Um, the communities near me, um, like the city of Rochester Hills, for example, I know they, they do a tremendous amount of promotion to get outside and have created trails and walking paths for the community and so forth. And, and uh, you know, largely influenced by this type of great research and this type of work. So for me, in my perspective, um, you know, continuing to uh, build the, the evidence of, you know, stress management techniques and, and um, you know, how can we deal with anxiety and boredom and all those kinds of things during this time and in the future, um, you know, this just helps that message and get outside and, you know, plant trees and, and you know, respect that nature much more and, and so forth um, and making that part of a strategy for health management is, is certainly going to be part of my um, you know, going forward. Yeah, and to build upon that, um, we had a slide in here <laughs> about tree physiology and I was reading the article and for the life of me, I could not figure out how to adequately articulate it. But if I had to take away from it, it, it talked about how epidemiologists, I believe is how you say it, how those individuals are now working with urban planners who are working with landscape architects. Um, I think the word is getting out and just even looking at the attendance list of uh, the individuals who are on this uh, webinar today, people are finally realizing that we can no longer create communities in a silo. Everything has to work together. So like, for example, one of the things we like to say Trees are the only part of a community's infrastructure that actually um, increases in benefit over the years. It doesn't, uh, it increases in value. You know, if you've got pavement, you got a stop sign, whatever, it, it decreases in value. So I think the more that this research is done collaboratively uh, among these various groups and they share the information and then they take it all together. Um, I think it's, uh, I think we're on an upward trend. And again, having been in this industry for about 40 years now, this is very, very positive. I'm, pl I'm pleased to see it. Oh, and I also wanna say, and I think this is very important. Again, uh, there, when we first got started, I would never have, ever envisioned having as a partner priority health. That just wasn't, didn't seem to be, you know, what you did. And so the fact that companies such as uh, Priority Health and others are, are looking to partner and figure out how we can work together uh, is, is terrific and very, very positive. And it's our pleasure and it's our goal to help the community in as many ways as we can too. So beyond insurance and so forth, we, you know, we, are uh, a true community partner and we, we appreciate that as well. Thank you. Lynn, okay, how about we have a few questions left, um, but let's take at least one more here um, before one o'clock and then we can always follow up via email to anyone whose questions don't get answered. Um, but here's an interesting one. How can we persuade communities to plant their trees with good practices so they don't die early or prematurely? <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Um, okay, well, I think it's all through education. And I, get, I think to be fair, um, some of the individuals who are tasked with uh, figuring out how to do the planting, um, they don't have the background. They, uh, so it all comes down to education. And that's one of the reasons why we try to make as many of these um, presentations available. And we work very closely with ISA Michigan, the International Society of Arboriculture, uh, Michigan DNR, Urban and Community Forestry Program to get as much um, uh, education out there as possible. And one of the things that we do, which makes us a little bit different than other tree planting organizations is that 
you know, we, we don't just write a check. We, uh, we go out there, we take a site visit. We never do a planting without the involvement of the DPW, ideally the city manager. And so when we talk about what's the right tree to plant, um, we're, we're talking, we're coming with some expertise. And a lot of times it's just that the guy who's in charge the tr of trees today was in charge of something else yesterday. So um, education is the key and um, making ourselves available to meet one-on-one -on -one, uh, with these communities, I think goes a long way because, you know, a lot of times, you know, you go to a conference and, you know, who wants to raise their hand and ask a question? I think this chat is the best thing that ever happened. We get more questions that way than we normally do, you know, face-to-face. -face. So um, just a, a lot of ongoing education and making, um, uh, information available. We have a lot that's available on our website and we're just now offering a municipal membership uh, which is tailored for every single community individually uh, to again another way of, of trying to get out the information and making ourselves available. Thank you. Um, I'm sending out I'm sending out the link to the Google form for the ISA and SAF continuing education credits in the chat right now. Um, there are a few more questions. I'm not sure, Melinda, do you want one more? Uh, sure, I'll do one more. And then like you said, we can, um, you know, if people put it in chat, uh, we can refer, we can get back with you. Sure. Um, I'll I'll throw you an easy one to answer. Um, recommend, do you recommend tree watering bags for new trees planted? Along Main Street. Okay. Um, we definitely, well, yeah, we recommend watering bags mainly because uh, they're 15 to get 20 gallons, they're drip. So uh, it's not like you come around and you water it and then it just seeps in it just over the course of about, 10 days, depending on how hot it is outside, uh, the water just trickles in. So it's a more consistent watering. Um, another product which is out there with the weirdest name is a, a tree diaper, which is what we're attempting. Uh, we're gonna be trying this year in some locations and supposedly um, then you don't have the green bags sticking out. You've got uh, something on the ground that uh, absorbs the water. Uh, but anything like that. But Main Street always makes me nervous a little bit because you want to make sure that uh, the root systems underneath the concrete have lots of good soil in which to grow. So, you know, if you just dig a hole, open up the concrete, stick in a tree without there being, um, you know, adequate uh, different types of soil that are made for such situations, the trees aren't gonna be viable anyway, but yes, at a minimum, I think watering bags are a great way to go. So um, if anybody else wants to continue to write uh, questions and with your email, we'll be happy to get back with you, but I know a lot of you are on a, uh, a time schedule. So we have lots of references. Uh, as you can see here for everything that we quoted that we'd be able to uh, be willing to make available. And I can't thank you enough for taking the time. And again, I'd like to thank uh, Tom and Priority Health and his staff uh, for believing in us and sponsoring this uh, webinar. And hopefully it'll be, uh, there will be more to come. So thank you all and have a great afternoon. Thank you.